Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And it is the first Sunday in May this morning, May 7th, 2023. And it is a little bit rainy outside, uh, but that brings the May flowers in. So uh, that should be good. We've got just a, a couple of announcements this morning. One is we do have a potluck today, so please stay afterwards. Um, we've got tons and tons of food, and it's a way to get to know one another. So uh, we'll fellowship afterwards. We do have communion also, guys. On Facebook, who are following us right now, you can gather your bread and, and wine or grape juice or whatever you have to join us in communion, which will be just right at the end of the message, and that God joins us together in God's way. Uh, and then another thing is, it looks like Pooh, this is a Pooh report, Pooh is coming home, coming home this Friday. Yay! Um, we are looking for, Jenny is looking for people to sit with Pooh. There's going to be lots of people visiting Pooh, understandably. But we're looking for something a little bit more scheduled because Jenny needs to work during the day. And uh, just to be able to sit with Pooh and encourage her and, and do whatever, you know, like lifts with her, whatever we could do therapy-wise. But uh, just, just to be an encouragement. And I think it'll be really, really good for her to be home and in her own bed. So... Uh, in charge of this program? And Jenny will be, um, and all you need to do is call into Jenny, and I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to post her number on our website, www.lighthousechurchdrummondisland.com. <laughs> Go to the website, and you can get Jenny's number there, and just and call her up. Say, well, I can sit with her on Monday, you know, from you know 10 to noon or something like that, you know, a little block of time. So uh, that would be good. Please keep Pooh in your prayers. It's progress, but it's really, really slow. So, uh, but it is progress. So, looking forward to seeing her and seeing her back on the island. Anything else that I'm. Oh, and just to remember to uh, mark J uh, June 14th on your calendars for Baked Goods Bingo. It's a we're a little early in the season this time, that luck of the draw, but uh, we'll make the most of it. So, June 14th. If you can be at the Township Hall at 5 o'clock, we can get chairs set up and all the equipment and all that stuff set up. And uh, Again, you can go to the, the web page and see what times you can bring in baked goods. Please encourage your neighbors, friends, strangers, enemies uh, to, make, to make baked goods because the more baked goods we have, the better the event is and it should be a lot of fun. So hopefully there'll be lots of people back on the island by... June 14th, Flag Day, and we can have a great time across the street. Officially starts at 7 o'clock, but we're asking helpers to be there at 5 o'clock. Is there anything else I should say, Connie, on the Baked Goods Bingo? Covered it all? Mr. Complete, aren't I? Yeah, wow. Okay, well, let's start with a prayer this morning. Got a real interesting message this morning. One of those real kind of brain teasers to get us thinking, and the gears worrying. We're at W H I R, not worrying, worrying. Thank you, Jesus, for creating us the way that you have created us. Thank you, Lord, that you give us open doors and open windows, places, new places to see, new places to walk through. Help us to have a new vision, Lord, of how we are in this world and where we belong. Give us a new sense, an open sense of your Holy Spirit leading us and guiding us into places of freedom and joy and places of love that we can share with one another. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. First song that we're about to do, um, and I always feel like I need to say something about this, is called Jubilee. It's by Michael Card. And it is based upon the Hebrew idea in the Hebrew scriptures. talks about every seven years you've got a, a Sabbath where you let the land rest, the crops, you don't plant crops. You gather all this stuff up in the sixth year, and then the seventh year is a rest. Well, every seven times seven years is what's called a jubilee. And that's like the big rest, the big Sabbath rest. And not only do you let your crops rest and the animals rest and all of creation is supposed to kind of rest with you, 
You uh, set slaves free, too. You know, offer slaves a chance to be set free. And, and they can go on and do their business, or they can continue to serve uh, your household. It's, it's just an interesting economy that God had put together. Of course, Jesus does some interesting things with that in the New Testament. But the idea of Jubilee is, is that God is here. We're not to become attached to the things in our lives and the stuff of our lives. We're supposed to everything give everything to God and that we live out of that gratitude that life becomes a gift. And that sets us free. In turn. So that's what this song is about. Listen to it, but sing with us. Jubilee by Michael Card. <coughs> and Ruth is not, we can keep Ruth in our prayers. She is feeling better today, but she caught something coming back from Florida. So, uh, but she said she's feeling better. Hopefully, she's listening to us this morning. Yes. And uh, good. Love you, Ruth. Praying for you to feel better. But, uh, here we go with Jubilee. It goes something like this. The Lord provided for a time for the slaves to be set free, for the debts to all be canceled, though his chosen ones could see. His deep desire was for forgiveness. He longed to see their liberty. And his yearning was embodied in the year of Jubilee. Sing with us. Jubilee. Jubilee. Jesus is. Tells us we are free. He is the incarnation of the year of Jubilee. Jubilee, Jubilee. For oh, Jesus is the Jubilee. That's for given. For slaves and Find the Savior there. Jubilee, oh Jubilee. Jesus is the Jubilee. That's forgiven, slave set free. Jesus is our. our Sabbath rest. He is slaves set free. I think you've heard this song before.
nada. I am thinking that the strongest human desire other than for the physical needs of air and water and food, but the strongest soul desire of a human being is belonging. And I mean that in the fullest sense of the word. Belonging, not just a love connection, I mean that's part of it, but it's a love connection that allows you to understand and discover in a deep way where you belong in the midst of all the relationships that you have in this world, not only with people, but also with the earth itself, the creatures, the sky, the sun, the moon, everything, everything, including yourself, where you belong and that loving connection that is there for you. That, that is the strongest human desire. So, so strong. There's a problem though, and that is that we have a problem with attachment. Because we get these desires, a good desire, which is built into us for belonging, we get overly attached. We get overly attached. And, and I see this in different signs all around me, not just in my counseling, pastoral counseling and things like that, but I, I see it on, on the news. I see it in all sorts of different, in fact, I'll, I'll, I watch uh, highlights, baseball highlights, you know, praying, rooting for the Tigers. Hey, they won like four, four or five in a row, by the way. Wow. Woo, thank you, Jesus, <laughs> because we know it's a miracle. So... Um, <laughs> But, but I'll watch these highlights and inevitably there's always, it's always like there's this one commercial that plays. But even that, see if you can see the signs of attachment in this. Go ahead and run that, John. It should be tucked be behind Song Show Plot. There you go. You'll probably recognize it. Little arrow at the bottom. Wait for it. <laughs> go ahead and turn it up. subtleties there, you know. Hi, Mom. Everything's great. And the wife kind of just kind of gives one of those smiles. <laughs> yeah, not so much, Mom. So there's a little, maybe there's a little too much Mama going on here. You know, a little bit too much attachment there, um, where it should be more focused on his wife, things like that. So we get, we get some attachment things messed up. We do this with spouses, too, at times, in relationships, spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends, what have you, where there's too much of an attachment, too much of an identification there, too much of your own identity that gets kind of wrapped up in that other person. And, and, and this can happen in a, in a variety of different ways. Maybe you, you've experienced that, but it's, it's basically belonging out of balance. And so what I wanted to talk to about this morning is something akin to this, but it's not external. In fact, got a, uh, I came across a Psychology Today article just yesterday, interestingly enough, recent article, and it deals with this, and I'm calling it 
uh, attachment versus um, I mean, I, I, connection and ca captivity. Connection and captivity. This particular psychologist, or actually psychiatrist, talks about attachment and authenticity. Attachment versus authenticity and the balance between those two. And the, the quote from this particular psychiatrist uh, says, we're born with a need for attachment, I'm calling it belonging. Attachment and a need for authenticity. So attachment and authenticity, who you truly are. Psychiatrist Gabor Mate explains in his book, The Myth of Normal, The Myth of Normal. He says, most people abandon their true selves, that is authenticity, to please others and keep the relationships, attachments, even if they are ones that are toxic and destructive. You ever seen that before? Where somebody maintains a relationship with a toxic person. I mean, we're all fallible human beings, right? You know, we're, we fall short of, of being perfect, wonderful, loving human beings. But there are those who are working through really deep psychological stuff where there's destruction that happens. And you have to weigh that, you know, when do you pull back? How much do you pull back? Uh, when do you have healthy boundaries in all of that? But for those who don't have those boundaries, it, there becomes what psychologists call a fusion. You become fused. So no longer are, you, are there clean lines about who you are, who this other person is. It becomes fuzzy, in fact, really, really fuzzy. So that's not good. That's not a healthy kind of relationship. And so we tend to overattach sometimes, and, and we all do this in different periods of our lives. We overattach to people, things, ideas, different stuff. I'd like to talk this morning about emotions or feelings that we experience inside that we oftentimes over-identify, over-identify with the feelings that we have and that there's a healthy balance that remains there too, a healthy kind of attachment where your authenticity is still alive and vibrant, you know who you are. but. We can over-identify with what we feel. Over-identify with what we feel. Now, feelings are gifts from God. I mean, even anger, what we consider negative feelings, all this, they're still gifts from God. Happy, sad, joyful, depressed, whatever we're feeling at a time, those, those are all feelings that are built into us. They're like barometers. They tell us what the weather's like, what's going on inside our psyche, how we're responding to the world around us or inside of us is really where it takes place. But there are times where we over-identify with those feelings and you aren't just feeling anger, you see yourself as an angry person or you aren't just feeling depressed, but you see yourself as a depressed person. And that, that identification closes in. The problem with over-identifying with our emotions is that it can lock us in. It can put a prison around who we are. And we, we see ourselves in these tiny little places, these constricted places. And there's no way out sometimes. And so I, I'd, I'd like to talk about these kinds of emotions, the over-identification, and look at it biblically. And there's, there's not a lot you can jump off of psych... Well, the, in some ways there are. There are some interesting psychological cases of people in the Bible uh, that we can jump off of where they, they have some emotional imbalances, you might say. I mean, I think of... Uh, I think in the Old Testament of Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar, and we read about him in, in the book of Daniel. And Nebuchadnezzar had some, his emotions were way up and down and all over the place. And of course there are ideas of grandiose, you know, I'm, I'm king of the universe and I can order anything around. But, but besides that, there's all sorts of emotional instability with Nebuchadnezzar to the extent that finally he has the big mental breakdown and he's like an animal out in the field and sleeping out in, under the stars. And, 
And there is a happy ending to the story, but you'll have to read the book of Daniel on that or take a Bible study from Greg. But, uh, but, but Nebuchadnezzar, he really had some messed up stuff going on for him emotionally. I think about King Saul in the Old Testament. King Saul had some major, I mean, he'd be a psychi psychiatrist dream study, you know, to try to understand uh, abnormal psychology. Uh, King Saul was just all over the place, too, with depression and anger and, and tried to throw spears and stuff at David and, and just was really, really messed up. Well, he had problems with that over-identification, too. And think about people, other people uh, in the Bible. I, I think about Naomi in the book of Ruth. And if you read the book of Ruth through, Naomi goes through some tough stuff like any human being. But she goes through death of her sons and, and just a lot of things happening, a lot of turmoil in her life. And she goes through depression and anger and, and bitterness. In fact, she says, call me bitter, call me Mara, which is the Hebrew word for bitter. And, and, and it kind of goes through this kind of negative thing all through the, the few chapters of Ruth until the very end. To the very end, and Ruth, Ruth gives birth to a little boy. And Naomi, the very last scene is Naomi becomes a wet nurse and is able to hold the child and be able to give that child nourishment and bond with that child. And something happens to Naomi. Something happens to Naomi. I want you to hold that thought. Paul! Paul the Apostle, he didn't have all his emotions together. Read Romans chapter 7 sometime. He's trying to figure out what's going on with this, this new vision of Jesus, this new idea of how to live. And Paul goes through uh, this struggle and this wrestle, emotional, deep emotional wrestling in Romans chapter 7. And he doesn't, doesn't know what to do. But then comes Romans chapter 8, the first couple of verses. And he realizes what it means to be in Christ. What it means to be in Christ Jesus. And it makes all the difference in the world. He understands that his true identity is resting in this person, this amazing person called Jesus Christ. That vital connection to God, Yahweh. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, that he is free, there's no condemnation for being in Christ, in Christ. The question in belonging is, part of it is, who am I? Who am I? But it's a question that can't be answered autonomously. You know, as if you were kind of disconnected from everything else in life and that you can kind of go, well, but who am I? Who am I separate from everything else? We can only answer that question in relationship, in a healthy relationship to those around us. Again, without being entangled, without being entangled or held captive. Jesus was able to pull off the who am I with the words, and we see this especially in the Gospel of John, where Jesus asserts who he is. He says, I am the good shepherd. I am the river of life, or I am the gate. I am this and that. Um, and Jesus asserts not only his connection with God the Father, but Jesus asserts a vital identity that I think we can pay attention to. And as we see him move through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we see him interact with people, and some really broken people, you know, whether they're physically broken or mentally or emotionally or psychically or whatever, but a lot of, and the way he relates deeply and compassionately to brokenness all around him. And, and he feels that deeply, and you can see that in certain spots. Where, where the Greek is very, very uh, profound and, and how he feels it deep inside his gut. But it doesn't hold him. It doesn't hold him captive. He's able to allow it to pass through him, to experience those feelings deeply and emotionally and weeping at times. But it doesn't hold him. 
captive. And that's our model. That's, that's what we're trying for, you know, in this life, is we're trying to be more like Jesus. And with his help, he gives us clues and hints, but also the Holy Spirit that gives us the power and the discernment to be able to kind of navigate this growth journey. And all of us are in different places, and that's cool and fine, and God's cool with that. But it's just, it's the idea of un beginning to understand what's going on inside of us, feeling-wise. And, and looking at our feelings honestly, not judging them, you know, getting all uptight about it, but looking at them honestly and in the light of God's light, and, and Jesus and you together looking at, where, where are my feelings going? What kinds of feelings do I have here? Stepping back in a way. And Paul does this. In fact, that's, that's part of uh, Paul's answer to his question. Paul discovers himself as somebody totally and completely different in this whole idea in Christ. Turn with me. You've got some Bibles around there on the tables, or if you have your own Bible, but I have a page number for the Bibles here. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. That's page 142 in your Bibles on the table. 2 Corinthians 5 is one of those most, and I've quoted from it lots of times, it's one of the most telling chapters in the Bible in the New Testament that gives you a picture of this new reality that Paul is dealing with. This is not about just a changed religion. It's not about just different kinds of rules and structures and, and some sort of dogmatic kind of area that he's moving into. It's nothing like that. It's something intensely, intensely personal. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 17. Uh, I'll go ahead and read that. So Paul says this, and listen to the, these words carefully and follow along with them in your own Bibles. Paul says, for the love of Christ controls us. The Greek word there, just little parentheses, the Greek word there means it, it, it means it holds everything together. It holds your vision of life together. For the love of Christ holds it all together. He'll say this in another letter also about Christ holding stuff together. But okay, the love of Christ holds us or controls us. I think that's a poor translation, but love of Christ holds things together for us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, therefore all died. And he died for all so that they also, they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. That is physically. We recognize him. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, Yet now we know him in this way no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there's a new creation. The old things are passed away. Behold, now new things have come. And then he goes, that all this is from God. He begins to talk about the whole idea of reconciliation, bringing things together. For him, Christ is even more than a person. That, that Christ holds the reality of who Paul is together. It's an interesting idea that Christ holds who Paul is together and that with Christ and in Christ, he discovers this whole, that there's a whole new creation, that the whole world has changed. His vision of the world, his ideas about the world, his former judgments have gone by the wayside. There's a whole new ball game going on for Paul. Everything has changed. And it, it's hard to grasp this, but, but then he says... He says, in this new creation, that there's a love that is mo a love that is motivating him 
in, in such ways that he, he just acts differently towards other people. And it's, it's sharing his life with others. That's the big, the big purpose, the big motivator, is to share this amazing love that he has to serve others, not on his own agenda, but on the agenda of the one who loves us and died for us. You look in uh, the book, one of his letters is a, letters, a letter to uh, a Galatian community of Christians in somewhere around Asia Minor in the area of Turkey. And he writes to these Galatians who, who are still kind of caught up in following rules. And, and again, not the rules are bad. But Paul continually says, but it's limited. Rules will only get you so far. There's something so much better. And, they, and that, that's where this in Christ thing comes from. And then he says in Galatians 2.20, he says, I am crucified, I, my old self, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But not I, but Christ who lives in me. <laughs> Figure that out. And he says, in the life that I live in the body, I now live by the faith, by faith, by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. What a crazy statement. But there's this partnership, this deep, deep partnership that Paul discovers that he has with God through Christ. A companion who will never leave him. A, a, a trusted friend who will never forsake him in any way, shape, or form. And he begins to look inside his, uh, his own uh, mental and emotional machinery going on inside there and he has a whole new vision and again it's motivated by that love that holds everything together but what it does is it begins it, it almost begins to set a, a basis or a platform for something that I think is important and an invitation to all of us then rather just feel your emotions, rather than just experiencing your emotions, that you can do this with Christ. You can do this with Jesus. You don't have to conjure anything up. You don't have to kind of, oh God, I hope you're with me and I hope you'll walk with me and all this. No, he's already with you. That's the good news. He's already a companion loving you and giving himself for you. And all the things that Paul says... All you need to do is find a quiet place, and that's maybe physically, but certainly internally, find your own quiet place, and begin to honestly look at your own internal kind of life. What's going on inside there? Are you angry? Are you happy? Are you sad? Are you joyful? Are you depressed? Are you whatever? And realizing that God never, ever judges you for any emotion that you have doesn't judge you for anything anyway, but I mean, certainly not for the feelings that you have. And God will walk you through those feelings as you're able to identify those things. And you almost do it as a, a, a little trinity, a little committee, where you have you, you have Jesus, and then you have your feeling. And to be able to step back a little bit and say, well, I'm experiencing this feeling. It's part of who I am, but it doesn't define who I am necessarily. And to be able to step back from that in the grace and in the love of Jesus and have a conversation with Jesus about this, that could be called prayer, right? Talk to God about what are your feelings and maybe the Holy Spirit will kind of speak to you or you'll hear about that and, and you can work through that feeling, do some things. Maybe like Naomi, rather than, you know, you, you give yourself away, like Paul says. You give yourself away in some way, shape, or form. And in that time, in that time of giving away that vulnerability, that God brings some healing in. And you can have a new conversation about that feeling. Oh, I'm seeing this from a new perspective. Turn with me to 
Final scripture is Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. That's page 158 in your Bibles, page 158. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. The idea of being connected to your feelings, connected to God, connected but never captivated. Not in a, a bad or a, a restrictive sort of way. Just like Jesus, connected but not held captive. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Actually, would somebody like to read that? Whoever gets there first, nice and loud. Sure, man. Go for it. Since then, you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts upon things which are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You have died, the old self, the old controlling part, the old over-connected part, that part that wants to make life just the way that you want it, in exactly that fashion, striving part, that part has died in Christ. And your life is hidden with Christ, who is hidden in God. You're all, you're enveloped, in a sense, in Christ, who is enveloped in God. And that sets who you are, that safe place where you can be yourself, sets who you are, because you are always loved, always connected, always affirmed by that presence of Jesus Christ in your life. Can you imagine if we actually understood and accepted and trusted that good news, how our lives would be different, how our fears and our anxieties and worries and, and all this, everything that we feel, how that would be different, affected, if we truly trusted that we were hidden in Christ who is hidden in God, that our place is secure. It is. And that's what Paul was trying to get across. But Jesus was trying to get across. That's what God's trying to get across in this whole book is that faithful love that is there for each and every one of us and to learn to live that whole new reality. But it starts inside and it starts with an honest journey of looking at our own relationships and, and especially, I mean, you know when your buttons get pressed, right? You know, and... It, and stuff happens, and, and to be able to reflect back on that, when you feel your stomach tighten and your brow get furrowed and everything else, and you know something's going on inside, and to honestly take a look at that, not alone, but with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, to take a look at that and to evaluate that, to step back and say, well, I experienced that. What is that telling me? What's the barometer telling me about my internal weather scheme? And then to walk with that, step by step, in the grace of God. We're going to sing a song called In You. And it talks about this idea of being in God, in Christ. And even though God covers the heavens and the earth, there's no place that you can go where God isn't. God doesn't impose God's personality or, or power or anything else on us. That to be in Christ requires a trust response, a gratitude response, some sort of open response on our part. In You talks about that. And we're going to, as, as these guys are getting ready, we're going to, you've got communion sets with bread and, and grape juice. If you take one of those, and everybody's welcome to do communion with us. And remembering that the bread is symbolic of Jesus said, I am the bread of life. That's one of the big I am's in John chapter 6. And, and Jesus is trying to get us to understand or grasp that God's in all the common, simple elements of life. You know, it's not just about church or stained glass windows or, you know, kind of sacred spaces. Um, that every place is a sacred space. 
that all the common elements of our life, every bite of bread, every sip of wine, every what you know, whatever we're partaking in is a sacred space. And he says, do this in remembrance of me. Why? Because he's with us wherever we go. And there's that communion aspect to everything that we do. So something as simple as bread. And so we say, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the bread of life. And that by taking this into our bodies, symbolically, we are taking you into every cell of our body, every cell of our being. These little carbohydrate things going on inside of us. So take your bread. And we say, thank you, Jesus. And take, eat it. Likewise, we, we take grape juice, wine, different traditions, symbolic of the blood of Christ and the idea that, that blood carries life and is so important. And, and especially in the ancient mind, I mean, that's where the life was, was in the blood. No blood, no life. And of course, that makes sense. Um, so this is symbolic of the life of God. And we're saying the life of Jesus, we, again, take into us. And we say, I want to live by your power. I want to live by your discernment, your wisdom, not just mine. You know, I want to live in that grace. I want to follow that pathway to the best of my ability. So we're pronouncing and saying openly, I want to live in a new way. I want to follow this Jesus in the way that I can accept and understand that each in our own way. But we're saying yes to a new life, what Paul talked about. So take the grape juice or wine or whatever we have, and we say, yes, thank you, Jesus, for your life. Listen to the song, the words of this song. Let it be a meditation as we kind of say thank you to God for all that God gives to us and especially the ability to be in Christ emotionally, mentally, in every way.
on Facebook for joining us this morning. We appreciate your prayers. Do give a response. I know this is kind of like a deep psychological thriller or something. I don't know. But if you got any part of this or the Lord sparked something for you, do respond, you know, in the, in the comment section on your Facebook page because it could help somebody else or spark something for them. But we do thank you for your support, your prayers, your financial support. You can go to our website if you feel like giving, you know, one dollar or a million dollars. We will not accept more than a million dollars, though. I, we draw the line there, so we do have limits. But um, you can go to our website, www.lighthousechurchdrummondisland.com, and uh, find all sorts of good things there, including Jenny's phone number, which I'll post later on. Don't go there yet. I'll post it in a little bit after potluck, uh, after my nap. No, just kidding. But uh, thank you so much. God bless you guys. Have a good week and bear the light of Christ joyfully.